Well, good afternoon, everyone. I think it's been a long se session, and I ask you, those of you who are struggling, to take a deep breath and, and give yourself a minute to just quiet, okay? The things that I want to address rather quickly um, are coming from a different place than our panel. I'm going to speak to you as someone who has been involved in ministerial care of women and men who've been touched by abortion since 1984. In 1984, I founded Project Rachel, which is the um, outreach of the Catholic Church. It is a ministry that is contained in a diocese with the blessings of a bishop, with the contact information, and a network of specially trained priests and mental health professionals who will provide one-on-one -on -one care for women and men who have been touched by abortion. This ministry has grown um, throughout the years. The day after I did the first training, it went around the world in terms of information and has continued to do so ever since. All right? um, the book that we referred to was published by the Vatican Publishing House, and it's actually in Italian, so if you want to read it, I hope your Italian is, is good. All right? um, I'm going to speak about the aftermath of abortion and its impact on family. I'm not using the language of syndrome. I'm talking about the full spectrum of men and women whose lives have been touched by an abortion, many of whom would not have a full-fledged psychiatric diagnosis. They would be somewhere from mild, mildly troubled to severe and have a diagnosis of post-abortion syndrome. But there are many people who are somewhere in the middle. And it is important that we understand that anyone we may come in contact with whether it's a woman or a man, may have a history of abortion. Their own, their sisters, their mothers, <coughs> their brothers. We have all been touched in some way. I believe that with, with all my heart. The bottom line is that the woman who has had an abortion is a mother who has lost her child in a traumatic and unnatural fashion. And that is the seed of the difficulty. She is someone who may be grieving, and she may grieve at any point in her life from right after the abortion to many years later. If any of you work with the elderly, with geriatric populations, oftentimes you will encounter elderly women who are incredibly agitated. They're ready to die. We think they would have died a couple of days ago, and yet they will not let go. You need to find a priest or a, or a minister for that woman to talk to her about what's going on, because many times there is an old abortion 50, 60 years ago that is still troubling her. Abortion is a universal phenomena. It is not unique to the West. It has been in the East for a long time. And the aftermath of abortion was recognized in the East as early as the 1950s in Japan when they had temple ceremonies, and they continue now, to help parents who aborted their children to mourn and to grieve. The one thing that differs from culture to culture is how do we explain the problem and how do we grieve. And so in Japan and Taiwan, and Taiwan these are called baby spirit programs, these are temple ceremonies designed to appease the spirits of the unborn child because their belief is that if an abortion happens, this child cannot continue its spiritual growth through the process of reincarnation. It has been stopped, and their description is that these children turn ugly and create mischief in their families. But the mischief that we see is universal across cultures. It's the same familial response, okay? Now, I want to share with you I, something that I think is incredibly interesting and valuable science. And this is science that is not necessarily well known across the medical field, but it is incredibly well researched. And that is that mothers carry cells of every child they ever conceive for many decades after the pregnancy ends, possibly to the end of their life. That's not known. This phenomena is called fetal microchimerism, these cells are present throughout our mother bodies. They are transferred to us and can be found, they can be found by four weeks post-conception in our bloodstream. They may be there sooner. We do not know exactly how they transfer, but we do know that they are present. And that it goes a step further that these cells are now transferred when we have another pregnancy to the other offspring. So any of you sitting in this room who have older <coughs> brothers and sisters, you carry their cells in your body. We do not know what their purpose is, but we do know that they're present. There is an article in Scientific American, and if any of you want to see me afterwards, I'll give you the citation, that very clearly describes this, and, and you could use it to make people aware of, of what is there. The reality is that the mother then has biological knowledge of the children who are lost. 
whether through an abortion, through a miscarriage, and full memory of her other children as well. We need to recognize that men are changed by pregnancy. We've been talking about women. We've been talking about the baby. No, we aren't talking about the men. Men are touched by abortion, and their hearts are broken sometimes. For every abortion, there's a father. Why would he be bothered? We are told that he is simply a sperm donor, and it's a woman's body. But the reality is, that man may recognize pregnancy in their partner before she even knows she's pregnant by a change in scent through something called pheromones. Eighty per, as many as 80% of men will have symptoms of pregnancy with their partner. It's called kuvat. Primitive cultures know about this. We've forgotten. He may be nauseous. He may have headaches and backaches and toothaches, and he has eating cravings for food. He gains some weight. And about six weeks before the baby comes, he undergoes hormonal changes. His testosterone drops radically, his estrogen rises, he has more cortisol to be protector, he has a unique male hormone called vasopressin, which is a bonding hormone, and right before the baby arrives, he gets prolactin, which is the nursing hormone, for at least six weeks. When his hormones go back to normal, they never go back to normal because his testosterone is forever lower than it was when he was a bachelor. He has changed. We do not know the impact on the male whose body has been triggered by the pregnancy of his partner and now it ends in an abortion. It stops. But we have done two conferences on men and abortion in the United States called <coughs> Reclaiming Fatherhood. They were international conferences. We need to talk about the impact on men. Men have many scenarios. They would have, some would have stopped it. Some are told they can't stop it. It's a woman's choice. Some agree. Some forced. Each one of them has a different time when the grief might be triggered. But for these men, this is a serious issue. For some, there's suicidality, there's grief, there's rage, there's chemical addiction, there's a, there is alcohol use, there is sexual addiction, and there's pornography, because men tend to run and hide from sexual encounters after that. And not all do, but for some, that's where they go. This awareness of the connection into family systems is important. Because if there's been an abortion loss for either partner, it comes into the marriage. 30% of couples will remain together after an abortion. They marry, and it's an atonement marriage. We're going to live happily ever after, and we don't discuss the abortion. But the abortion goes directly into the bedroom with us and into our intimacy. And we do not trust each other, and we find that our intimacy is deeply damaged, unless we've talked about this and forgiven each other and really begun to heal. Of the other 70%, they go on to marry other people. And many times, he brings in abortion losses, she brings in abortion losses, and they don't talk about them. And when they become fragile, this becomes an issue. There's transference that goes on. He's just like that man who forced me to have an abortion, but that might not be his story. She is just like the woman who had an abortion against my wishes. I wish I could have stopped it. And this because it's not discussed. <coughs> we'll destroy marriages, we'll destroy communication. Couples build walls around their heart that gets in the way of their intimacy. In addition, these previous abortions for the woman may increase the risk of prematurity and low birth weight babies. This creates additional stressors on the family. The father oftentimes is deeply, deeply concerned during the pregnancy. He is terrified that something is going to happen to his partner and to this child. The mother is reminded during the pregnancy of the previous abortion losses and many times does not bond well in utero. This can leave a permanent wound in the subsequent children. She may have a very difficult delivery because she is in a high state of chemical arousal and so it may be an interventive. We may need a cesarean section. We may have some other things going on. These are things that increase stress in families. Women who are unhealed in subsequent pregnancies when their baby comes, do not connect well. They are very overly protective, but oftentimes very distant emotionally from the child. The child reminds them of this loss that's unhealed. Fathers tend to become enmeshed with this child. He is, he is totally focused on his child. And he becomes an overly protective father. If we have overly protective fathers and mothers, we have people who have some serious emotional damage that they're carrying around. We need to know that other family members are impacted. Grandparents may be the ones who force the abortion. That will break the relationship with their child, son or daughter. 
they may find out later, and now they're, they're angry. Why did she have an abortion? Why didn't she come to me? I'm worried about her. There are many, many scenarios. We need to know that the siblings may suffer because they carry cells. And they will sometimes tell you, I always knew I should have a brother or a sister. <coughs> How do they know? What is that about? They have also grown up in a household where things may not be working the way they should because of this impacted grief that the parents are struggling with. And furthermore, brothers and sisters and other family members and friends will struggle afterwards with loss. They went to the clinic with her, they thought they were helping her, and now she's struggling. And so as we talk about this, it's important to know that the wounds of abortion are across the board. They aren't just the worst case psychiatric um, diagnosis, but rather anyone we know who's had an abortion could be suffering to some degree. And it may come on suddenly with something called a trigger incident where today I know my abortion's a problem. I might not have recognized it for the past 10 years. I might have been acting out in terms of alcohol or other things, but today I know it's a problem. I share that with you because as people doing pro-life work, we need to be sensitized to the people around us. We need to be aware that sometimes the most angry people are the ones we should not argue with. We should be quiet and we should say to them, why do you feel this way? Can you just share with me? I'd like to understand. Under doing that, you open the door for their healing because they've never had a chance to tell anybody why they feel this way. And it might be their own abortion, it might be someone else's, but we can be the instruments of healing. We are told by both, both Pope John Paul the Great and by Pope Benedict that we are to do this work. We are to bring them to the church for healing. And in section 99 of the Gospel of Life, Pope John Paul promised them that there would be people to help them. And Pope Benedict, in a, in a document from 2008, took it a step further and said, to all of us, that we must be the good Samaritans who bring them to the church for healing. So that's my challenge to all of you. How do we help people to heal? Those that are healed, the men change the culture, the women change the heart of the culture, and it is there that the culture of life is born. And we need to be about supporting that. People who are healed after abortion are never pro-abortion. They become pro-life. I have with me um, the Project Rachel Ministry Handbook this is available again, see me afterwards. Um, the bishops of the US have this on their website. It is at this point translated into Spanish and Portuguese, also Italian, but I don't think the Italian is online yet, and English. It's there for you to share with your priests, with your bishops, with whomever, so that we can all be instruments of healing. So I thank you for this opportunity. God bless you for all that you do. The importance of understanding that abortion is also at the core of the breakdown of the family in many places is an important piece for us to keep in mind. Thank you very much.